Good to see this Lord's Day as so we're making our way rapidly toward the end of 2021. Um, let me mention a couple of things uh, for your attention here. Um, our, uh, of course, our weekly schedule of, uh, of gatherings and such, we will, a uh, men's group will not meet on Friday. Um, uh, and yet I do think the, the women's groups, the Tuesday evening Bible study and the uh, book club will carry on this week as scheduled. Uh, it will be the second Wednesday of the month and the monthly fellowship meal. Uh, we, it will uh, happen on Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock. And, um, and of course, also note that uh, later in the month, the fifth Sunday, 31st, everybody knows what day that is, right? It's Reformation Day. Um, October 31st, we're actually going to get to stick around at the church and have a meal. Um, and uh, so uh, that'll happen then. Uh, take notice there. Um, you've, received the, um, uh, you've received some other, more information uh, regarding the November 7th um, officer election. Um, essentially, after going through that process, uh, we have uh, Mike Tannock <coughs> uh, up uh, for an elder. And Johnny Jones uh, back there uh, up to return. Uh, he is a deacon uh, uh, and, and been a deacon here, but would return actively uh, to to the diaconate. And so uh, we may have some more information for you as we approach that time. But it's a thirty day notice, so uh, that's why you've gotten that so far ahead. And then um, so we appreciate your participation uh, in that uh, process. Um, I have. Uh, learned, didn't realize this, I think some knew that uh, Miriam uh, Slack is dealing with a kidney stone, and um, so we, we want to pray for her and, and for their families that deal with it. Um, I also mentioned, Rob, some of you may remember, it's, it's been a while now, but a um, friend of, of Rob's, uh, Brad Patton, uh, Mr. Patton had uh, attended church here some and come to meals and things like that. And he is, um, his health is declining pretty rapidly, and um, he's, he's, he's very much depleted of, of energy, and Rob would appreciate uh, your praying for him at this point. Um, also, uh, Marilyn and Carol both, as they're, they're both going through treatments for cancer, 
Uh, they both have had to spend a little bit of time in the hospital, uh, but um, I just um, I think they're both out and and, and, and you know and uh, uh, have returned to uh, to at least an adequate level of strength. They both are looking toward more treatments, so you certainly want to continue to uh, lift them up in prayer as well. Uh, we'll try before uh, before a vacation week here to tr try to get an October list updated with the few changes that we have for uh, prayer um, and uh, and all. But um, anyway, that's things you'll want to be aware of, um, of today. Uh, with that, let's uh, take just a minute uh, to uh, prepare our hearts for worship as we come this morning. the one announcement that I just spoke to someone about right before walking in that I completely forgot is WIC is scheduled for tonight and um, I know uh, Mar Marsha had originally been host she and Jessica worked out arrangement uh, Jessica Jones will be hosting and she's going to have that at their home 227 Westbury um, at the front of the neighborhood so now is this a pool party or uh, it is pool party okay so uh, <laughs> Uh, don't, don't know what the water would be would be like right now, but anyway. Uh, so uh, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. at the Joneses' home for the week meeting. Psalm 118 says, "This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it." Um, there's a, there's something evident in the revelation that God has created, and is it is this that everything we have. Everything that we observe, everything uh, that we do is really a gift. And I think one of the things about that expression is we wake up and as the prophet Jeremiah said, your mercies are new every morning. Every day is a gift. This is the day the Lord has made. Well, in another sense, it's a special day because it's the appointed day of the assembly of God's people for his worship. And so... Uh, for two reasons, just the gift of life and a new day, and of course the gift of the special uh, assembly of God's people with God himself. Uh, we have gathered to worship him. How about we join together in a hymn of praise, 111, This Is My Father's World, 111. <laughs>
come before you this day, <clears throat> recognizing that all that we see, all that we observe is from your hand. You are the great creator. You are also the great redeemer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have many reasons to come to worship you, to ascribe to you glory and honor and praise. We, um, we pray that uh, at this time of year, as soon the uh, trees will change, uh, the colors will be all around that we will recognize the beauty of your handiwork and we will give glory to our great creator. We also pray that we will always be attuned to the beauty of your redeeming work in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would emphasize and focus uh, on him, hold him up and hold him out, uh, encouraging one another in this gospel and also holding out the hope and the truth of this gospel to the world around us. Lord, hear our prayer, accept our worship this day, for we come in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the front of the hymnal has the Apostles' Creed, that brief uh, summary of Christian faith. <clears throat> and... Um, Certainly through the ages, uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ um, have used these words and have used them in liturgy and, and, and as part of the content of our worship to declare what it is we believe and uh, to be encouraged in that. I've told you this before, this is what he preached to me. You're giving me a summary of the gospel as I hear your voices kind of coming at me. Um, and of course, we together, if anybody were to be watching or listening, joining in online, whatever, we would be letting them know what it is we believe. So, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into hell and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hold your hand, Moles. We're going to turn to page 794 in the back for our, <clears throat> our reading. Psalm 29. Kind of uh, one of the, uh, whether you ever ask it to yourself directly or not, uh, is this question. Is, is it a terrifying thing or a comforting thing to acknowledge God as the sovereign, the one who's in charge, the one who ultimately ordains whatsoever comes to pass. Well, most are pretty easy to affirm it if we say, oh yeah, all these good blessings God bestows, we are very ready to have, you know, to accept that. Uh, how about when we consider that nothing happens that God doesn't, you know, oversee? And we consider all the, you know, the catastrophic and, and difficult things. Well, that's, that's one of the challenges being human beings in this world. Because uh, both are evident. God's blessings, as well as a sovereign dealing that often we would consider to be very hard. Well, uh, throughout the scripture... Um, God was not ashamed to reveal truth to say that he does this or that. And actually, I just say that because Psalm 29 would, would cause us to kind of reflect on that. And the conclusion is, is that we put our hope and we give our thanks and we will still look to the Lord for our help. Whatever he does, whatever is done. So we'll read, uh, we'll read, uh, um, and, and, and actually know that he will, uh, part of his sovereignty is to strengthen us. So we'll read Psalm 29 here um, responsibly. Give attention. This is the word of the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, 
Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon like a cat, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the understanding and the application of this portion of, of his word. May we recognize that the voice of God directs the things on this earth, even those things that twist and break and are to us apparently destructive, and yet may we also conclude that he will strengthen us and he is enthroned and he will bless his people with peace, that that's where we find peace in a world that is fallen and um, subject to all of the things that we see. Uh, it's wonderful to know him as <clears throat> Redeemer, that he has redeemed us in Christ. I will sing the wondrous story. We're going to turn to that and we count that for one another. Always be mindful of this sovereign Lord and how he has brought his wonderful uh, redemption to us through Christ. <clears throat> we'll, we'll remain seated as we sing here. Uh, 180, I'll sing all the, all the stanzas. I will sing the wondrous story. 180. <laughs> Yes, my son. 
We need to tell the story to ourselves over and over and over again. Um, God must not have uh, thought that it never, it ever needed to end because um, you know He He calls us together to assemble regularly so that we may continue to be uh, encouraged and reminded of His grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's uh, let us turn our attention uh, and lift up our concerns before the Lord as we're instructed in the Scripture to cast our burdens upon Him because He cares for us. Our Father, we come before you this day uh, thanking you for the many blessings we've received. We, um, we recognize your, um, your hand that has provided not only those things that we just need, but you've provided in our lives the things that enrich and fulfill us. And um, though we still struggle to appropriate them and to appreciate them, we can still uh, recognize that they are good. Your gifts are good. The things you provide to us are good. We uh, come today to acknowledge you and to recognize you for that and thank you for it. So we would pray your continued care over us as our good shepherd, as um, your people, the sheep of your hand, as your word says, uh, that you would care for us and lead us on. Uh, we would also pray for your spiritual leadership to lead us into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Teach us and apply to us your word, that word of truth, uh, that word of your grace and your care for us, and that word of good news of the gospel, salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, help us to remember that good news, uh, to recount that good news, to recall it, and uh, may it be to us a reason and a motive for faithful praise and ongoing obedience to your word. Lord, we lift up to you the needs of the people of this uh, congregation. We ask for your abiding care over those who need you in, in particular situations of, of need or vulnerability. And we would pray that you would care for them, that you restore the strength of those who are afflicted, that you would bring healing, uh, but especially be present with them in the midst of the struggles. We, uh, this morning, uh, we, we thank you uh, that, uh, that Nancy can be here with us and that um, she is seeing progress and though she must be patient a little longer, we would pray that you are with her and fully uh, return her to full strength to return uh, to her various tasks, responsibilities, and to bless our church family. We um, do want to lift up to you, uh, Miriam Slack, in, um, in dealing with this kidney stone. We would pray for you to uh, watch over her, to uh, provide for her comfort in a very uncomfortable condition, and that you would quickly resolve this and bring her through. Pray for uh, Brian, Mary Hayden, or others who may be assisting her at this time. We um, uh, also want to pray for um, especially Marilyn and Carol as they deal with these uh, cancer treatments and, um, and their recent uh, need to go to the hospital. In both cases, we would pray that you touch and heal their bodies. We are earnestly and even boldly uh, pleading with you to uh, fully heal and restore both of them to complete health. That is our prayer. We would we would ask you for that. Um, we don't want to be selfish. We don't want to be um, overzealous in our praying, but your word tells us to be, um, to be this way. And we have every reason to, because we have so many situations in which we have prayed and you have in your marvelous providence and good favor for your people, you have brought healing and you have restored full health and strength to so many that we pray for, uh, even with cancer. And uh, so we, we um, lift that up to you and we praise you for your good care and we pray for your care over those two at this time. I also want to pray for Rob's friend, Brad Patton, who had visited our church on different occasions and I would pray that you be with him what appears to be um, as he is nearing the end of his life in this uh, world.
world. Uh, I pray for gospel peace or gospel comfort and uh, for Rob and others who would be with him and offer him words that, that you, would, um, you would be present in and through them and that he would find comfort in, um, in, in Christ. Um, we, um, we love you for your care over us. We long for a perfect, a harmonious, peaceful existence. We observe and suffer, though, from this fallen world. And yet, uh, though we would like to be completely removed from the effects of this world, we yet are satisfied and comforted by knowing that you have brought the resolution. You have provided all that's necessary for us to overcome the effects of the fallen world, to be able to be redeemed from the guilt and consequence of not only our individual sins, but the power and the condition of sin over us. So, Lord, encourage us with the gospel, the good news that the Lord Jesus not only lived righteously and died to pay the penalty for sin, but he was raised to new life to conquer and to win the victory over all of the effects of sin. We look forward to the day in which we will be brought into your presence, made like Christ our Savior, glorified with him. Until that time, strengthen us by the ongoing presence of the Spirit. Lead us into holiness more and more and renew us in our living Lord day by day. For your name's sake, we come and we lift all this up in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. As the ushers now to come as we worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Doxology. portion of what you've given us as stewards of the material gifts. We ask you accept this and bless it and make it effective to uh, carry out the ministry in this place, to do our part to support the worldwide mission of the church and to fulfill the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust that you will do so. Make us generous in our giving and make us good stewards for your name's sake. We come and make our offering of prayer in Jesus and who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Be seated. We're going to turn to Colossians chapter 4. A few verses here in Colossians to consider today. In this section, it's very practical. Um, the words, the teachings are about 
practice, how to put into practice <clears throat> certain activities, <clears throat> how to think about our own lives, how we live. Uh, resolved all, the, all of the concerns last week that come from that passage that tells wives to submit, husbands to love, children to obey, slaves to obey, <laughs> and masters. Actually, uh, uh, in some ways, I guess I, I probably didn't drive home the point. Uh, the masters are reminded, you have a master in heaven, you better, you better behave in such a way to remember that. Um, in some ways, that's, uh, that whole section is about that. And I said, probably the next time I ever preach on this or the parallel section of Ephesians, I'm going to, uh, I must say, you know, all this is doing is, uh, call, is calling us to live a life that resembles something about the nature and uh, display the attributes of God. In each station of our life, each position, each role we play, there's something within the very nature, the attributes, the qualities of God that, that are to be reflected in that. Whether we're in a, in a, um, a superior position or a, an inferior or, or subordinate position, we are to reflect something in the nature of God. Okay, but we're not there anymore. We're now at uh, chapter 4, verse 2. I'm going to read 2 through 6 here. And um, I'm going to try to make you feel real guilty that you've not been praying enough. You know, you lousy Christians, you. That's the danger. Uh, there's certain things that come up that really the, uh, the tendency is to move in the direction of, of presenting it in such a way. But, um, I, you know, that's not the way we want to do this. This is an encouraging passage. This is, this is a passage of great instruction and encouragement to be devoted to prayer. And so let us see what it says, and then let's see if we can find the encouraging word of the Lord for us uh, to be devoted in prayer. So give attention. We'll start with verse 2. Colossians 4, beginning with verse 2. I'll read down through 6. This is the word of the Lord. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading the understanding, the application of this portion of his word. What is biblical spirituality? What are we called to in terms of our spiritual life? Really, prayer is that elemental, that foundational religious activity. It's a foundational religious activity. If someone believes doesn't even have to believe like we do. If somebody believes in a deity that transcends or is beyond just our finite temporal existence, then communicating with that deity is sort of a foundational way, not only to show I do believe, but I also am connected or can be connected with the deity. Now, there's lots of issues with the, with the many non-Christian and non-biblical conceptions and theologies uh, we pray to believe in the living and true God that's the expression that, that shows up in uh, scripture the true God and throughout the Old Testament Yahweh the great I am was known and displayed as the real God over against the pagan uh, idols of the Philistines and the Canaanites of uh, various groups over and over again. They could not stand against him. They could not thwart his ways, or rather he thwarted their ways. He asserted his own way. He covenantally brought a people to himself. He entered into and established a covenant with a people and then began to carry out his redeeming uh, purposes through that group. And of course, 
and later on promised that he was going to fulfill all of this to go beyond that group to the rest of the world. That's, that's the big message of the Bible. Started with Israel, and then through Christ, the true Israelite, the promised one, God has brought that covenant to the rest of the world. So much so that the Apostle Paul, a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day, you know, he had all the pedigree. He would say, we are all children of God, Jew and Gentile, through faith in Jesus Christ. We are all sons of Abraham, whether we descend from him or not. Why? Through Jesus Christ. Man of faith. So that's the big picture. And, um, but it's prayer. Okay, I've kind of moved on here. I want to remind you who, when we're talking about prayer, we're not just talking about an activity. We're talking about the activity that helps us engage and relate to the Most High God, the Most High God who has entered into covenant with us in and through Jesus Christ, the one whose redeeming purposes throughout Scripture and throughout history are known to us. And prayer is the way in which we relate. It's the foundational way. Now, there's a, it, especially if you understand prayer in the broadest sense, that even our praise even our words, of, you know, when we're singing our hymns, we're in prayer because we're singing to God. But prayer is central. It's central to that. Uh, it would do well, we would do well to, rem to remember that because very easily prayer becomes, uh, in teachings about prayer, even, you know, very much uh, looking at the biblical passages, it can become something that is burdensome. Remember in the garden, what did Jesus tell the disciples? He said, look, I'm going to go over there and pray. And what? Y'all stay here and pray. And I think he said, y'all. I really do. I think he said, y'all stay here and pray. He goes to pray and he comes back and what? They're asleep. Can't you stay awake just a little bit? And pray. Comes back. Comes back, they're asleep. They're just exemplifying what is real for every human being on the earth. Everyone who's in sin. Everyone who's fallen. It, it, it reveals to us the weakness and the difficulty and the challenge that it is in this task. So we can easily get into the thing where we're looking at prayer so tightly, so closely, that all it becomes is, you know, you really ought to be doing more of it. You need to pray more. Oh, do you not spend X number of minutes in prayer? Do you not do this? Do you not do that? And before long, it becomes this legalistic burden that weighs us down. And we have forgotten what it's all about. What it's there for. Well, let's not let this passage do this because it, I, think, I think as uh, Paul brings it and he comes to this place in Colossians where he's given this practical teaching. Essentially the first part, as all his epistles, what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. And then it hinges and he begins to give them practical. Minute. Here's what your life, here's what you are to be concerned about practically as a result of your union with the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And it starts with, devote yourselves to prayer. Prayer, that foundational religious activity. Well, let's, we'll work our way through this. But the first thing I want you to notice is that that question, what is biblical spirituality? What, what is it at the center? What is at the heart? What is the kind of the mode and the mechanism of our of our relationship with God. Remember, let's not forget that Paul wrote this to this group of Christians who were dealing with a, a group of various ones who had come in and to try, tried to impose upon them and to uh, bring before them really a, called a counterfeit gospel. He didn't use those, he didn't use quite that direct language, but he's clearly pointing out that the gospel that had been proclaimed, that they had received, that he was uh, reminding them of is impressive. It, 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 what had come in with this group, these opponents, was contrary to the truth. Back in chapter 2, I'm going to remind you, here's the kinds of things they were saying. Uh, it, uh, apparently, because he's counting, he says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, new moon, celebration, or Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things. The reality is found in Christ. Do not let anyone del who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. 
Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen. His unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He's lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God calls it to grow. They were saying, here's how you properly relate to the unseen God. Okay, here are these festivals and feasts. You may make sure you abide by those. You perform those. You do those. And oh yeah, by the way, there's all these things here that we need to mark off that you're prohibited. Do not do these. Do not eat this. Do not drink this. Do not carry on in these ways. And also there was obviously some kind of a presentation that the intermediary, some kind of uh, intermediate angels, were also the focus of their concern. And Paul's addressing it. We, we can't pull it all together, all it was. However, some of these things later when the, uh, a, a philosophical theology called Gnosticism comes around, it seems like uh, some of those ideas were already present. It seems like. In other words, there's, and, and here's a temptation and a possibility that still exists throughout all history, not only in biblical times, but even today, is this tendency. We, I mentioned this somewhat this morning in our adult class said, there's a tendency for us to be drawn to some kind of a legalistic spirituality. It's a draw. You know why? Because I, I think primarily we want to be in control. Tell me what to do and what not to do because I just need to know that so I can control it. What does God want? Tell me what to do and not do so I can control it. I can do and not do those things. The reality is what? You think you're in control, and then you find out very quickly you can't control those things as much as you think. That's one problem. Because of our corrupted heart, our corrupted nature. Uh, secondly, uh, we will idolize the things. Those things become the things in and of themselves that we're, that we're concerned about, not ways to relate to the true and living God. And so... All those things are an issue, and I, I believe that's, that's the contrast. And when he flips to start telling them about the practical implications, and he gets to this point, they devoted to prayer, he's essentially saying, here's what true spirituality is. It's a life devoted to prayer in communion and communication with God. This is the mechanism. This is the channel that connects us with God. Don't look to mystical ideas. Don't look to some kind of you know, uh, devised way of, of making yourself special and somehow entering into some, some uh, unusual experience. And definitely don't look to the things of this world to do or not do them. That's not true to prayer. That foundational channel of relating in direct communication with God. Well, what does he tell them? Devote yourselves to prayer. Now here's where it could be tough because you know, I mean, there's very few people you ever run into that seem to uh, have come to this particular place of sanctification and Christian growth that they can just kind of always, probably regularly, daily, maybe multiple times daily, just kind of lose themselves, lose themselves in this kind of sanctified, consecrated time and, and seem to not have any trouble with that. <clears throat> But there's only few. There are some people like that. It's wonderful that the Lord is, uh, has some people like that. For the rest of us, though, I believe it, it's an ongoing challenge. And so to be told, to devote ourselves to prayer, is something we need to always be told. Not as a way of guilting us into something, but to remind us and to encourage us. God listens to us. He hears us. Be devoted to prayer. He loves you as his own child. Go to him in prayer. The devotion here, this, this term, the way I say it in Abiyah is devote yourselves, uh, be constant in prayer, but there's various expressions that could be used here. It kind of has the same sense that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says pray, you know, the old way, pray without ceasing was the old way, or pray continuously. Which probably suggests this. It's not simply a matter of you know, finding those times in your schedule where you completely separate, but rather it's, it's like an ongoing, regular disposition of our heart toward God. That we're always ready 
to speak to God. I mean, sometimes I, I mean, I would say this. I, I can't say that I fully fulfill that. I have much growth in this area. But probably some of the most genuine and most sincere prayers I've ever, ever uttered is because I hear about something and I immediately, there's nothing else to do but immediately give an expression to God and to ask for his presence, his power. And sometimes it's not even in words, it's a groan. And thankfully, as Romans 8 assures us, the Holy Spirit will even take those groans and make them make them useful, make them presentable before the throne. Uh, I guess what I would say is this. We have no reason not to, to, you know, to be devoted in prayer because we, God is so good to us. We have everything in him. We are children of the king. We know him as our father. Um, and so this devotion, this ongoing and regular readiness and by the way, something that crossed my mind. You know everybody, everybody prays. Everybody does. Well, what about those hardened atheists that just can't stand the thought of us <coughs> affirming the deity? What I've noticed, and again, I know I'm, I'm sort of making a sweeping generalization here, but I've noticed that those people are the ones who actually verbalize their prayers more than others. Because let that hardened atheist be presented and overwhelmed with some kind of, you know, whatever, catastrophe, bad news, sometimes even good news, and they don't care to say it. Oh, my God. Now, yes, I know they violated the fourth commandment. They, they're using that name in vain if they say that, but they say it. They can't get away from it. They're religious at heart at the very center of their core. Even when they deny it. Let us not let them outdo us in prayer. <laughs> Let's be devoted to prayer. Let's be ready at a moment's notice. Whatever we face, not in a uh, not in this um, not in the way of you know of the of the unbelieving heart, but in the way of a believing heart. That when we utter it, we mean it, and we know the one to whom we express it. Devote ourselves. Now you'll notice it also says be watchful and thankful. The watchful part, kind of like a watchman, <laughs> like, like a security officer, uh, being ready, being watchful. Part of our devotion and prayer is to do so in and in, 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 have this character of always being watchful and ready. It's the things that can come against us and to be ready to pray about it, to lift it up to the Lord. And of course, uh, in thanksgiving or and thankful, it's uh, actually very literally, the, the Greek would look a little different in its word order here, but essentially it helps us know how we can do this. You know, often because of this challenge that we always have, this easy distraction and our worries about the things of this world, the, uh, uh, you know, so it's, oh, you need to pray. You need to pray more. You need to be devoted to prayer. And you're like, yeah, right. I mean, I'll try. I've tried, I've tried to do this over and over again, but it's a challenge. So it turns our attention to a few things to think about. Being watchful. Being watchful. Being ready. Notice the things that are potential temptations and challenges to you. And make sure that's what you express to the Lord. Notice within your own heart the things that can well up. The discouragements, the anxieties that overwhelm, and your feeling of helplessness that. And take that to the Lord. Be watchful. Be aware. Sort of like a security. A, a, a watchman. Let that be your. Let that be the thing that cues you to what to pray. And how to approach the Lord. And then in Thanksgiving. I've mentioned this. Actually Colossians is interestingly. As much as Philippians. Seems to keep re, re, repeating this word. Thankful. Thanksgiving. And with thanks. Or some other expression. And the reason that thanksgiving is always an appropriate prayer is because that's we're acknowledging God's gifts, what God has done for us. And certainly as we think about our redemption, we thanksgiving or thankfulness, gratitude is simply a response that realizes that something has been done for us, given to us. 
That is the gospel. You are made, declared righteous in Christ. It was accomplished by someone else. Devised and planned and carried out by someone else. And it's been handed over to you as a gift. And the only thing you can do is with thankful faith receive it. And our prayer should be filled with thanks. So, so really, I mean, <clears throat> actually all of the scriptures give us plenty to think about in terms of our prayers. But one of the challenges that people often say is, I don't know what to pray for. Don't know how to pray or don't know what to pray for. Well, if the only thing you think is look at your life and consider your salvation in Christ and simply utter back to God your thanksgiving for what he's done for you and given to you in Christ. Now, if that's not enough, let's continue. Verse 3. <clears throat> and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. And then he goes on to say, Paul says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now there's some interesting things to be derived from this verse. It also gives us another thing to be praying about. Always, you can always be praying to the Lord about the gospel ministry, about the proclamation and the advancement and the clear, uh, you know, the clear uh, proclamation of the gospel. And we even need, we need to pray that more and more even now. That darkness, misunderstanding, and all sorts of all sorts of ideologies prevail, which are clearly hindrances to gospel truth. To pray for that. And, I, and by the way, if the Apostle Paul needed and asked and pled for prayers, I am pleading for your prayers for gospel proclamation and clarity. And for everybody who opens up the word in any context to pray that the Lord would provide them utterance to make clear the word of truth throughout all the scriptures, but especially that word that proclaims the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. That it would be uh, not only clear, but also savory. We'll get to that in just a second. Now, notice here, Paul is praying. He, he says, I am in chains. He's in prison at this point. He has written this, uh, this, this, uh, you know, this epistle, probably in a close range in a time frame was Ephesians, and also uh, the epistle that we that is entitled Philemon. We'll get there, okay? You'll see why, uh, why we, why we uh, get there and a little later because he wrote to Philemon on behalf of this slave named Onesimus. And we get into the latter part and we see that Onesimus is part of a group that's going, he's going to return and he's going to help deliver these letters, these epistles. And so, so here's, here's Paul's situation. Notice what he asked for though. Now I know what I'd be, I know what I'd be asking for prayers for if I were in chains, if I were imprisoned and I were, and I were an apostle. Make sure you are devoted to pray for us that we may be delivered from these chains so that we can carry on with what God has in store for us. This grand plan to send us to the ends of the earth to spread the gospel to the heathen, wherever they are. That's what I'd pray for. That's what I'd be asking for prayer for. What does Paul ask for? Now, there are, there are times, you know, I don't, I don't think Paul's uh, resistant but what's his concern here? That God may open a door for our message. Okay, now that might be a hint that he's suggesting the open door, you know, for freedom. But he doesn't really, he doesn't really carry that to its conclusion. He says, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Kind of suggests he's still able to preach wherever God puts him. Remember in Philippians, he says, you know, I've learned a secret of contentment. Whatever, whatever, in plenty or in want. You could maybe even paraphrase it this way. In plenty or in want, in freedom or in bondage. I know the secret. You know what it is? I can do anything. Plenty or want, freedom or bondage. I can do it all. Why? Through him who gives me strength. 
Paul never thought, oh, the only way for effective ministry is for these circumstances to be all worked out in perfect order so that I can carry out my ministry. Rather, he knew that in any circumstance, God could use him and Christ could strengthen him to carry out. He's not really praying. He's not really asking for prayer for, for freedom, although that would be one way that the door be opened. But that the door be opened, that this message could be proclaimed and the mystery may be made clear of who Christ is. We should always, always be praying that. Every time we pray, God will take at least one sentence to ask the Lord to make effective the gospel ministry. And then if you want to get specific in your own pastor, preacher, on others that you know, the missionaries that you know, wherever, but to pray, Lord, make it effective. And equip them and anoint them with the Spirit to make this mystery of the gospel clear. And notice there that that's what he says. He doesn't say to proclaim it boldly. He says proclaim it clearly. You know what? The great challenge of being a preacher and a teacher of the Bible is the challenge is to make it clear. It's really not that hard to be bold. You just got to raise your voice a little bit. Snarl your eyes a little bit, you know. I could even make it more if I had a really large King James Bible that droops over. And it'd be better. I don't have it. I got my grandfather's fingers. But if I had one of those big, long, crooked fingers, I could even make it more. But it's the boldness is that. Now, obviously, the boldness in Scripture is more of boldness to be true to that word in the face of really danger. And that's some of our brothers and sisters around the world need that prayer. But here the concern is mostly clarity and that that's mystery be made known. Not it's a mystery that is beyond human capacity, that, but it's a mystery in the sense that we, our natural minds won't get it. There has to be Holy Spirit-driven preaching and understanding to be able to grasp this truth. I mean, think about it. A man died on a cross for us. You know, he talked about that in 1 Corinthians. It's a stumbling block to Jews and Gentiles at some, at some level. The only reason we get it is because... The scales have been removed from our eyes. So pray that those would be done. And that the, the message, the messenger, the message, and the recipients will get it. We'll understand it. It'll be clear. And then he, he goes on about some of this. And, and now this isn't about him. He's actually then moves into some teaching about how they can think about their own witness. Their own testimony of Christ. Um, and so, do that. But, but just notice that. There's always opportunity. It should always be a concern of ours. Just as it's a concern to be ready to respond and, and to give to God some response in any occasion. It's definitely always, always an appropriate opportunity to, proclaim, to pray for the effective proclamation of the gospel. general ways or in particular ways for particular people. For clarity, spirit will to equip to make the mystery of Christ clear in this proclamation. Now, what about us? How about our witness? That's the, that's the next aspect. So devoted to prayer, praying for gospel ministry, and then witnessing to the gospel ourselves. And uh, <clears throat> notice it says in verse 5, be wise in the way you act toward, toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It is, uh, uh, it, it, it turns to not say prayer about this, but be aware, be aware and be wise in how you represent Christ to others. Be wise about that. Notice a couple of the things that are mentioned here. Be wise the way you act toward outsiders. Be wise. Something we're going to have to more and more pray for and ask for wisdom. I think our natural inclination is going to be something that will not always honor and glorify Christ, but will actually not, and it may not be untrue. It just, we're going to need the Lord's ability and wisdom and equipping to be able to re represent Him the right way. If you want to 
read about how easily it is to be right and true and then misrepresent God. Just go read Moses' story again. God says, speak to the rock and give him the water. And in his anger, what did he do? Struck the rock. Gave him the water. It gushed forth. God said, what are you doing? He didn't, he didn't present it and represent God the way he had told him to. And actually, we're told here to be wise, to be understanding, to be, um, you know, to be, um, some, to some degree, we're called to be empathetic toward the outsider, the unbeliever, even the opponents. Now, there's a point, obviously, that when, when you're uh, meeting opposition is you have to stand firm, stand strong. But there's still an element here that's saying, uh, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. It's sort of like, uh, I think these expressions in Greek have something to do with buy up things, to buy them up. So every opportunity is there, it's like a chance. Okay, you've got to redeem this opportunity. Um, is that saying that every time you open your mouth, every time you have a conversation, I, I think there can be, um, you know, there can be an element of saying so many spiritual things that they become almost, you know, disregarded simply because you're just saying it so much or using jargon and all that sort of thing. But there are appropriately placed words that help, even when speaking to an unbeliever, to help just bring into focus your faith and your trust in God and how you believe and trust in Him in a particular thing. And it doesn't come across in such a way that's preachy or condemning or judgmental. It's a genuine and honest expression of where you are, who you are, and whom do you trust. And it's kind of that, that kind of idea. And I, I love the way it follows later. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace. See, there's where the wisdom, we have to be careful. Especially in terms of opposition and controversy and debate, it's so much easier to let that fury and that anger well up and uh, be bold. But we're told here that our conversation to be full of grace. That the words, the things we share, talk about, are to highlight the grace of God that's evident to us. A gracious God. Benevolent God. And that benevolence is seen and highlighted in His sending of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's this expression, seasoned with salt. Um... There's a particular soup of some kind that I think Brooks had at Olive Garden and she liked it and Lisa found a, you know, sometimes you can find those recipes. And you can make it yourself and sometimes it's better than what you find at the restaurant. Sometimes it, you know, like, I don't think they, I don't think they gave me everything here because it's not quite as good. Uh, but, um, you know, often uh, Lisa will say something about the salt, whether it needs more salt or it has too much salt in something. And usually I even know it's just right to me. I'm a Goldilocks when it comes to food. I mean, it's really hard to convince me that anything's not just right. I mean, it's, or, you know, I mean, I, well, no, I guess that'd be the opposite. I wouldn't be a Goldilocks. Goldilocks needs it just to be perfect, right, before she's happy with it. Um, <clears throat> I'm an anti-Goldilocks. It doesn't really matter. It, it can work. It can work. Um, but the salt content, it's savory. It helps it. It makes it palatable and pleasant to eat. Are our words pleasant full of grace when we speak, especially the outsider. Well, it's not easy to do that. Maybe that's one of the things we need to be praying about, whether it's in daily conversation, whether it's in a formal presentations, whatever it is. The odd thing is, is that in doing so, <clears throat> this, this seems weird, doesn't it? If you do this, then you will be able to know how to answer. It's like, wait a minute, that seems like you're saying two things, you know. It seems like there's something missing. No, it's in the process of doing it that you realize the ways in which you should answer. It kind of reminds you of 1 Peter 3, which says, you know, set apart Christ in your heart and always be ready to give an answer for the, you know, for the faith you have. Be ready. But to do so with gentleness. It says, uh, the gospel has been presented in very hostile, ugly, angry terms too much. We have to, we have to put into practice this. 
in preaching, in conversation, in writing notes, whatever we do. We need to make sure it's full of grace. The grace of God is known. It's very prominent. It's savory. It's beautiful. It's done so to present it as such a, a delightful thing rather than, rather than a, an ugly thing. And in the process of doing it, we will even know more how to respond to witness to Christ. Well, that's, that's what he's saying. There's an encouragement. By his telling us this, it's almost like an assurance. If you're devoted to this, God's grace is going to assist you in it. So I don't tell you, be devoted to prayer and, and season with Saul, full of grace and conversation because, oh, you've been not, you've not been doing so well. You need to do better. God's not happy. No, it's not. No. Rather, see the encouragement. God's grace and equipping is available. And, and we will serve well because God will be with us in it when we turn our attention to these things. Let us be devoted to prayer, <clears throat> watchful and thankful. Let us pray for the gospel ministry and let us take every opportunity to speak, to speak savory, gracious words, especially to those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. Amen. Let us pray the Lord will help us do it. Let's end with 533 today. It's a prayer. Okay. Draw me nearer. I'm going to sing verses 1 and 2 we, as we close asking the Lord to draw us nearer in prayer and our relationship with Him and obviously equip us for faithful service. Let's stand together. day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.